Hear these words, Jeremiah 33, 14 through 16. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute just, justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judas will be saved, and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this is the name by which it will be called, The Lord is Our Righteousness. Luke 21, 25 through 36. There will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and on the earth, distress among nations, confused by the roaring of the sea and waves. People will faint from fear and foreboding of what is coming for the world, for the powers of heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud, the power and great glory. Now when these things begin to take place, stand up and raise your hands, because your redemption is drawing near. Then told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is already near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away until the things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass. Be on guard so that your hearts are not weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness in the words of this life, and that, and that day catch you unexpectedly like a trap. For it will come upon all of you who live in the face of the earth. Be alert at all times, praying that you may have the strength to escape all these things that will take place and stand before the Son of Man. Home. The prophet Jeremiah speaks of a branch that will be raised. Jesus spoke of a Son of Man that will descend. Both point to a hope, a hope that calls us home our true home, where we're welcomed and loved and included, where there is justice and equality and peace. It's time this Advent season, time to go home. We light this candle as a sign of our hope, our strong hope that there is a way to go home, to the home in Christ, and it starts with us, and it starts here, and it starts now. 
it's time to go home. Would you please stand and join us now as we sing My Hope is in You. See 
I will be reading today from Mark chapter 1, 1 through 8. The beginning of the good news about Jesus Christ, God's Son, happened just as it was written about in the prophecy of Isaiah. Look, I am sending my messenger before you. He will prepare your way. A voice shouting in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord. Make his path straight. John the Baptist was in the wilderness, calling for people to be baptized, to show that they were changing their hearts and lives, wanted God to forgive their sins. Everyone in Judea and all the people of Jerusalem went out to the Jordan River and were being baptized by John as they confessed their sins. John wore clothes made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. He ate locusts and wild honey. He announced, One stronger than I am is coming after me. I'm not even worthy to bend over and loosen the strap of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the word of God for the people of God. You may be seated, and would all the children please come forward for the children's sermon. How we, oh, there we go. It worked. Okay, so I am ready for something big that's about to happen. What do you think it is? Christmas! Yay, Christmas! I'm so ready for Christmas. So look, look what I got. I got my package. I got my presents. I got my decorations. Hold on. I got my Christmas lights. I'm ready to go. Okay, so... I love Christmas. Do you love Christmas? How many of you love Christmas? Y'all love Christmas. What is your favorite thing about Christmas? What's your favorite thing about Christmas? Putting up our Christmas tree. Oh, that's a good one. How about you? Decorating our Christmas tree. Okay, okay, Asher. Presents. Presents. Worshiping God. Oh, I think Dax has got it covered, don't y'all? What's the most important thing about Christmas? Jesus. Okay, so we, it's his birthday. You all get a birthday, right? Every one of you has a birthday. Mine was last week. All of them get a birthday. So we have something in common with Jesus, don't we? And Jesus has, his birthday is at Christmas, Christmas Day, right? And so all of this, the tree, my lights, the presents, all that is getting ready to celebrate Jesus' birthday, right? So we do something else in, in our church to get ready that shows how we're getting ready. That thing back there in the back in the middle that Miss uh, Savannah just lit, the candles. Anybody know what that's called? Raise your hand if you think you know what that's called. Anybody know? No? Nobody's sure? Okay. It's an advent wreath. That's what that's called, an advent wreath. And each Sunday before Christmas Day, we're going to light a candle. And each one of those candles means something specific. And this Sunday is hope. So the scripture that we've heard about is all about hope. Now, the word Advent comes from a really old language, an old language that is so old that nobody speaks it anymore. No people speak it anymore. It comes from Latin, and it means coming. Because who's coming? Jesus is coming. So Advent means coming in Latin. It's so old that I actually took it in school. That's how old it is. What else? Santa's coming on my Christmas. Yep, that's right. But the most, most important thing is that Jesus is coming, right? So we're going to remember when we light the Advent we each time that it's each one of those things is a Sunday getting closer to Jesus' birth. Okay? So today was hope, and I'm going to get this order wrong. Pastor Leah helped me to learn which ones go when, but I'm going to get it wrong, but I'll try. So today was hope. The next one is peace, joy, and then love. So we're going to do all of them in the Sundays up till Christmas, okay? All right, so can you bow your heads with me? Lord, thank you. You can repeat if you want. You want to? No? Okay, I'll just do it. Okay. Lord, thank you 
for Christmas, for the birth of Christ, and all these different ways we can celebrate. Help us remember the reason that we're celebrating is the wonderful gift of Jesus' birth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And what do we say to the congregation? I am convinced this morning. Are you convinced? Sure, there's a few of you that would go along with me. Maybe other of y'all are thinking, I don't know, what am I convinced of? That we've learned that just saying yes to you might mean that we've committed ourselves to something. I am convinced this morning without a shadow of doubt that there is nothing in this world, nor demons, nor angels, nor any power that can separate us from the love that is in Christ Jesus. Now, are you convinced? Amen. Amen. Well, as we head into the busiest season of the year, oh, whoever wrote the song, Most Wonderful Time, really sure wrote the most busiest time of the year. And yes, I realize that that's really bad grammar as well. But uh, what are you preparing for as you look ahead in your calendars, what are you preparing for kids to be home from school? Are you preparing to have family over for dinners and Christmas parties? Are you preparing to buy presents? Are you preparing to bake those wonderful goodies? Maybe you're already looking at your calendar and thinking, go, 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 go. Well, the good news is that today we're starting Advent and Mark. And for those of you who love to keep a schedule, who are go, 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 boy, does Mark have the Advent story for you. For Mark is known as a hurry-up gospel. In fact, within the gospel of Mark itself, the word immediately is used 41 times. It's, well, and usually in the sense that Jesus immediately, 41 times, Mark says, immediately. So Mark, in his hurry-up gospel, he just skips right over the nativity. Or does he? No, it's true, Mark doesn't have the nativity that you and I are used to. He doesn't have Mary and Joseph and the angels and the shepherds, and the sheep, and the manger, the no room in the inn, and of course, baby Jesus arriving. Now, Mark's nativity story begins with John the Baptist. He starts off with John the Baptist. He starts off with this guy who is dressed in camel hair, and he is eating locusts and honey. Now, add that to your nativity set. I almost think that would be a great addition to the nativity set. One, yes, I realize that John the Baptist wasn't grown when Jesus was born, but it would also be serve as a centerpiece for a conversation when somebody came into your house. It would give you a chance to witness. And as Christians, aren't we always supposed to be looking for opportunities to witness to our faith? but it could also serve as a reminder. A reminder that we all need as we prepare for Advent, as we enter in to a busy Christmas season. You see, Christmas, we listen to songs that sing Silent Night and Holy Night, but honestly, and I'm including me, how many Silent Nights are we going to have in the next month? How many holy moments 
are there going to be? You see, John the Baptist is perfect that he bursts onto the scene in our Advent because it's John the Baptist that is saying to us, slow down, pay attention, change your behavior, change your attitude, in fact, even change your priorities during this time. Prepare for Christmas and not buy packages and meals, which is all great, but prepare your hearts for the arrival of the Messiah. See, you and I, if we're not careful, we get trapped in this artificial world that we create. This artificial world that turns Christmas into a consumer, a marketing. When Christmas really invites us to slow down, pay attention, and to sit in awe of the wonder and the mystery, the trust, and the faith. John 1.14, the message version. I love the way this sums up Christmas. John 1.14, isn't it interesting? John doesn't have the traditional nativity story either, but he has a, he has a Christmas story. John 1.14, hear these words from the message. The Word took on flesh and blood... And he moved into the neighborhood. The word took on flesh and blood, and he moved into the neighborhood. Uh, I want us to take a moment and just think about together, what does it mean that Jesus moved into our neighborhood? That he took on flesh and blood and moved into our neighborhood. You may be thinking, Pastor Leah, I get it. I know Christmas is about Jesus being born, Jesus coming to earth. But I'm really not ready for Advent. Are you ready for Advent? There might not be a truer statement for any of us here in this room. Because are you ready for God to break into your lives? Are you ready for God to break into your life? Are you ready to God to break into the chaos, the disorder, or even God to break into the perfect life, the calmness that you have going on in this season? Are you ready for God to break in? Because that's how you get ready for Advent. We get ready by preparing your hearts, by surrendering to the God who's taken on flesh to move into the neighborhood, to move into our mess, to move into our hearts? Or is the truth you and I really just want to stay in the self-made world that we've created? Maybe, maybe it's because we're comfortable there. And I don't know about you, but I think sometimes... We are okay with a God in heaven. A God that we can sing some really great songs to, that we can pray to, that seems distant. But we don't want God who moves in and says, I'm going to change things. Furthermore, do we want a God who moves in and says, not only am I going to change things, I'm going to change you. Is that where you're at this morning? Are you saying, or is your heart prepared for the God who took on flesh and blood to move into your neighborhood, to move into your life, to move into your heart? Maybe you say, well, no, because of what I've done. The shame that I feel. You know, shame is one of the biggest lie tellings, things we face in this life. The biggest lies. Shame has power. It, it, 
entraps us with no, not more power than God. But it's a lie. Because shame tells us those lies that if they know what you had done, nobody could ever love you. It tells us the lies of that there is no such thing as hope. It tells us the lies that we are worthless because of an action. It is the biggest lie telling, but it doesn't come off. Not, just because it's the biggest lie teller doesn't mean that it's not good at telling lies. But this is preparing for Advent. The good news is that God breaks into our shame. God breaks in and says, shame, you can't live here anymore. See, God loves you so much that he took on flesh and he moved in. Oh, my heart this morning is screaming that if you don't get anything else, that you know that God loves you. And if you are carrying shame, if you're feeling worthless or helpless or hopeless, to know that God, that's not God. God's not saying that to you. God is saying you are worth him leaving heaven, taking on flesh, moving in, and God says we're going to deal with that shame. We're going to stop with those lies that you've been telling, that has been telling you, you've been telling yourself. And that there is such a thing as hope, and things can change. For a truth about heaven, maybe the truth is today that where you're at is, God, okay, I really want you to break in. God, I've been praying for a breakthrough. I've been praying for you to move into my chaos. God, because that's where you're going to find me. Yes, it's a joyful time of the year, but it's also hard. I imagine it's hard for many of us sitting in this room and maybe watching online or hard for someone you know. For many people, this season is filled with sickness, illness, cancer diagnosis, divorce, separation, grief and loss, questions that are left unanswered. But God moves into that place as well. God took on flesh and moved into our hearts. You see, God knew we couldn't get to him. So he said, all right, I'm sending Jesus, and he's going to land right in the middle of your joy. He's going to land in the middle of your hurts. And he's not going to leave you alone, and he's going to transform us. Maybe the season away, when we do find those silent nights or the silent time, which I recommend we all do, maybe we answer the questions God's asking us. Like, where are you? God knows where you're at, but maybe God needs you to speak it. Who told you that? Who told you what you've been telling yourself? Why are you afraid? Those are just some questions as we prepare our hearts for Advent. Now, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said that those who experience Advent know that they are poor, know in spirit, know that they're imperfect, but also they're waiting and expecting and knowing that God is bringing greater things. So my question to you this morning is, how have you experienced Advent? Advent is just not this season. While we're still on these, this earth, we experience Advent over and over and over again of God breaking into our chaos, God breaking in and saying, I'm here and I'm going to change your behavior, I'm going to mess up your plans, your plans, I'm going to replace them. And I am going to have, I really want to place on that plate 
that you tell people all the time is too full. My plate's too full. Guys breaking in saying, I need a spot on that plate. Maybe I even need the majority of that plate. That's where I'm moving in. That's where I'm pitching my tent. How has God broke into your life? Thirteen years ago, I had what uh, Advent that always sticks out in my mind. Um, Thirteen years ago, I I was battling depression. Yes, preachers don't have a bubble. We we battle just like our parishioners do. And I was down a dark path, and it was. It was right before the first Sunday of Advent. And I had prayed, God, help me. But I also wanted God to leave my self-made world together. Well, God broke in. And the thing about God breaking in is God says the first thing that has to go is that self-made world. God broke in through a friend of mine who loved, me, who loved me where I was at and then helped me get the help that I needed. And that was God, folks. The counseling, the support groups that I went to afterwards, that was God bringing hope. That was God's answer to my prayer. That was God continuing to break in. See, that's what Christmas is about. It's about hope. And Miss April couldn't have been more right to these kids this morning, telling them the scripture is about hope, even though it doesn't say a word about hope. You see, John the Baptist is saying, prepare your hearts. John the Baptist calls people to repentance, to seek forgiveness. John the Baptist says, change your lives, change your behavior. Because hope is here. Hope is coming. God is taking on flesh and moving into the neighborhood. God is going to enter in this chaos. And there's hope that this chaos would be transformed into beauty, to use God can and does bring healing in God's ways, not ours. And God also breaks in to show us what to do once we've accepted that hope. You know, recently I've heard different people in places that have read things about saying, well, I didn't know what to do once I became a Christian. Well, what you do is you learn to live in Christ. Hopefully you have a mentor who comes along and shows you how to live in Jesus and teaches you that discipleship is a process. It's a long obedience in one direction. It's obedience following the one who broke into to bring us hope. Hope that there is healing. Hope that the pain I'm feeling is not going to last forever. Hope that the person I'm praying for, God is working, is working on their heart. Hope that there is one day this world that breaks their heart is going to be set right. So prepare your hearts. What do you need to surrender in preparing for Advent? What do you need to take off your plate? What can be pushed aside? Maybe to the dessert plate. I'll get to that if I have time. So that God can feel it and you be filled with hope. How do you prepare for God to break into your chaos? You surrender. John... Uh, Mark uses the word, two different words for prepare. And that's on purpose. Remember, Mark is go, go, go. So he's not going to repeat himself. He's, he's really right to the point. Maybe one of these days I'll preach a Mark sermon 
get right to the point and say, go home and be like Jesus. Probably not, but we can hope. There's hope for that too. But the first word for prepare, the Greek, it means something like to furnish, to transform, to equip. It's the same Greek word used in Hebrews when the writer of Hebrews talks about the ark. It's meant for the presence of divine presence and divine purpose. So here's what John the Baptist is telling us about Advent. He's saying prepare to be made into a vessel of hope. Prepare to become a vessel of God's grace, God's compassion, God's mercy. Become, prepare to become hope. Not only is God moving in to give us hope, God's moving in our neighborhood to help us become hope. To those who need to see it. And in order to do that, we have to slow down. Slow down to see the hope, but to also be the hope. The second way he uses prepare, it's kind of like prepare, get ready for a big event. A big event is coming. You and I know that Christmas is a big event, but you and I are also waiting for a greater big event. And that big event is the second coming of Jesus. Coming when all, there's no more tears, no more pain, no more heartache. So you and I now live in this time between where we have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, those of us who believe and in the church to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to move into neighborhoods. That means to move into people's lives. It's not nosy, it's, it's caring. It's caring enough to ask the really hard questions. Hope. Hope moved in. And because that, we all have hope. If, if you are here, or if you're watching online, or you know somebody who's given up on hope, if you're here, please don't leave here today without talking to me, or without finding a Stephen minister, or talking to somebody you trust. Because there is hope. There is hope. There is no pain that God can't heal. There's no door that God won't open. You see, that's the thing about Jesus. Jesus came to a world that's broken, that knew pain, that knew felt hopeless. But Jesus came, and the soul felt its worth, and a new day dawned. you're hopeless, reach out. You can even Google. You can Google someone to talk to when I'm feeling very hopeless. And there are 24-hour hotlines that you can call. Because this is what the season's about. It's about Jesus meeting where we're at and bringing hope and transformation. As the band comes forward, I invite us to enter into a time of prayer. I invite you not to worry about what people think. That's the kettle calling, that's the pot calling the kettle black, I'll be honest about that. But if you know if you need prayer, you know someone who needs prayer, I invite you to come forward. I invite you this morning if you feel like you've never prepared your heart, surrendered your heart to Christ, today's the day. God is knocking at the door of your heart, ready to break through. I invite you to come forward and let us pray for you. Let us pray. Gracious God, We're preparing 
really and truly, we're looking, we're, we're preparing, yes, for the birth in the manger, but God, we're also preparing for your second coming. Lord, we know that one day you'll return. Evil will be completely defeated. Death will be no more. Pain will be no more. Suffering will be no more. But while we wait, you empower us. You, move, you can move in to the darkness, to our joy. You rearrange our worlds. God, maybe we start with empty plates this Advent season. Maybe for some of us, we surrender to you our calendars. God, maybe we say, Lord, you show me where you're shaping me to be a vessel of hope. God, your light shines in the darkness. And you've called us to shine as well. So gracious God, fill us with the eternal hope that we have in you. For God, we are fully convinced that nothing in this world, no power, nor demon, nor angel, nor any principality, no pain can separate us. No sin can separate us from the love you have for us. God, quiet the lies. God, help us speak truth. Jesus, we're ready for a breakthrough. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. And would you please stand and join us now as the offering baskets have passed for our closing song this morning.
God, can we sing that chorus again? And let that be the, your prayer. Holy, there is none like you. Lead me in your love to those around me in my neighborhood. Let me be Jesus' hands and feet who came to pitch his tent, who took on flesh and blood to move in the neighborhood, your neighborhood. That's also all of our calls now. Let us pray it. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to God. Show God's love to those around you. Be that vessel of hope God's creating you to be. Go in peace.